Chapter Nine of the Life Everlasting by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lisa Statler. Doubtful Destiny. His voice was calm and conventional, yet I thought I detected a thrill of sadness in it, which touched me to a kind of inexplicable remorse, and I turned to him quickly, hardly conscious of the words I uttered. "'Must the glory fade?' I said, almost pleadingly. "'Why should it not remain with us?' He did not reply at once. A shadow of something like sternness clouded his brows, and I began to be afraid, yet afraid of what? Not of him, but of myself, lest I should unwittingly lose all I had gained. But then the question presented itself, what had I gained? Could I explain it, even to myself? There was nothing in any way tangible of which to say, I possess this, or I have secured that. For, reducing all circumstances to a prosaic level, all that I knew was that I had met in my present companion a man who had a singular, almost compelling attractiveness, and with whose personality I seemed to be familiar. Also, that under some power which he might possibly have exerted, I had, in an unexpected place, and at an unexpected time, seen certain visions or impressions, which might or might not be the working of my own brain under a temporary magnetic influence. I was fully aware that such things could happen, and yet I was not by any means sure that they had so happened in this case. And... While I was thus hurriedly trying to think out the problem, he replied to my question. That depends on ourselves, he said. On you, perhaps, more than any other. I looked up at him wonderingly. On me? I echoed. He smiled a little. Why, yes, a woman always decides. I turned my eyes again toward the sky. Long lines of delicate pale blue and green were now intermingled with the amber light of the afterglow, and the whole scene was one of indescribable grandeur and beauty. "'I wish I could understand,' I murmured. "'Let me help you,' he said gently. "'Possibly I can make things clearer for you. You are just now under the spell of your own psychic impressions and memories. You think you have seen strange episodes.' These are nothing but pictures stored far away back in the cells of your spiritual brain, which, through the medium of your present material brain, project on your vision not only presentments and reflections of past scenes and events, but which also reproduce the very words and sounds attending those scenes and events. That is all. Lac Corisk has shown you nothing but itself in varying effects of light and cloud. There is no mystery here, but the everlasting mystery of nature, in which you and I play our several parts. What you have seen or heard I do not know, for each individual experience is, and always must be, different. All that I am fully conscious of is, that our having met, and our being here together today is, as it were, the mending of a broken chain. But it rests with you and even with me, to break it once more if we choose. I was silent, not because I could not, but because I dared not speak. All my life seemed suddenly to hang on the point of a hair's breadth of possibility. I think, he continued in the same quiet voice, that just now we may let things take their ordinary course. You and I, here he paused, and impelled by some secret emotion, I lifted my eyes to his. Instinctively, and with a rush of feeling, we stretched out our hands to each other. He clasped mine in his own, and stooping his head, kissed them tenderly. You and I, he went on, have met before, in many a phase of life, and on many a plane of thought, and I believe we know and realize this. Let us be satisfied so far. And if destiny has anything of happiness or wisdom in store for us, let us try to assist its fulfillment and not stand in the way. I found my voice suddenly. But if others stand in the way, I said, 
he smiled surely it will be our own fault if we allow them to assume such a position he answered i left my hands in his another moment the fact that he held them gave me a sense of peace and security sometimes on a long walk through field and forest i said softly one may miss the nearest road home and one is glad to be told which path to follow yes he interrupted me one is glad to be told his eyes were bent upon me with an enigmatical expression half commanding half appealing then will you tell me i began all that i can he said drawing me a little closer towards him all that i may and you you must tell me i what can i tell you and i smiled i know nothing you know one thing which is all things he answered but for that i must still wait he let go my hands and turned away shading his eyes from the glare of gold which now spread far and wide over the heavens turning the sullen waters of loch corisk to a tawny orange against the black purple of the surrounding hills i see our men he then said in his ordinary tone they're looking for us we must be going my heart beat quickly a longing to speak what i hardly dared to think was strong upon me but some inward restraint gripped me as with iron and my spirit beat itself like a caged bird against its prison bars in vain i left my rocky throne and heather canopy with slow reluctance and he saw this you are sorry to come away he said kindly and with a smile i can quite understand it it is a beautiful scene I stood quite still, looking at him. A host of recollections began to crowd upon me, threatening havoc to my self-control. "'Is it not something more than beautiful?' I asked, and my voice trembled in spite of myself. "'To you as well as to me?' He met my earnest gaze with a sudden deeper light in his own eyes. "'Dear, to me it is the beginning of a new life,' he said but whether it is the same to you i cannot say i have not the right to think so far come a choking sense of tears was in my throat as i moved on by his side why could i not speak frankly and tell him that i knew as well as he did that now there was no life anywhere for me where he was not but had it come to this yes truly it had come to this then was it a real love that i felt or merely a blind obedience to some hypnotic influence. The doubt suggested itself like a whisper from some evil spirit, and I strove not to listen. Presently he took my hand in his as before, and guided me carefully over the slippery boulders and stones, wet with the overflowing of the mountain torrent, and the underlying morass which warned us of its vicinity by the quantity of bog myrtle growing in profusion everywhere. Almost in silence we reached the shore where the launch was in waiting for us, and in silence we sat together in the stern as the boat cut its swift way through little waves like molten gold and opal, sparkling with the iridescent reflections of the sun's afterglow. "'I see Mr. Harland's yacht has returned to her moorings,' he said after a while, addressing his men. "'When did she come back?' "'Immediately after you left, sir.' was the reply i looked and saw the two yachts the dream and the diana anchored in the widest part of loch scavig the one with the disfiguring funnels that make even the most magnificent steam yacht unsightly as compared with a sailing vessel the other a perfect picture of lightness and grace resting like a bird with folded wings on the glittering surface of the water my mind was disturbed and bewildered I felt that I had journeyed through immense distances of space and cycles of time during that brief excursion to Loch Corisk. And as the launch rushed onward and we lost sight of the entrance to what for me had been a veritable valley of vision, it seemed that I had lived through centuries rather than hours. One thing, however, remained positive and real in my experience, and this was the personality of Santorus. With each moment that passed I knew it better, the flash of his blue eyes, his sudden fleeting smile, the turn of his head, the very gesture of his hand. 
all these were as familiar to me as the reflection of my own face in a mirror and now there was no wonderment mingled with the deepening recognition i found it quite natural that i should know him well indeed it was to me evident that i had known him always what troubled me however was a subtle fear that crept insidiously through my veins like a shuddering cold a terror lest something to which i could give no name should separate us or cause us to misunderstand each other for the psychic lines of attraction between two human beings are finer than the finest gossamer and can be easily broken and scattered even though they may or must be brought together again after long lapses of time but so many opportunities had already been wasted i thought through some recklessness or folly either on his part or mine which of us was to blame i looked at him half in fear half in appeal as he sat in the boat with his head turned a little aside from me he seemed grave and preoccupied a sudden thrill of emotion stirred my heart tears sprang to my eyes so thickly that for a moment i could scarcely see the waves that glittered and danced on all sides like millions of diamonds a change had swept over my life a change so great that i was hardly able to bear it it was too swift too overpowering to be calmly considered and i was glad when we came alongside the dream and i saw mr harland on deck waiting for us at the top of the companion ladder well he called to me was it a good sunset glorious i answered him did you see nothing of it no i slept soundly and only woke up when braille came over to explain that catherine had taken it into her head to have a short cruise that he had humoured her accordingly and that they had just come back to anchorage by this time i was standing beside him and santoris joined us so your doctor came to look after you he said with a smile i thought he would not trust you out of his sight too long what do you mean by that asked harland then his face lightened and he laughed well i must own you have been a better physician than he for the moment it is months since i have been so free from pain i'm very glad santoris answered and now would you and your friend like to take the launch back to your own yacht or will you stay and dine with me mr harland thought a moment i'm afraid we must go he said at last with obvious reluctance captain derrick went back with braille you see catherine is not strong and she has not been quite herself and we must not leave her alone to-morrow if you are willing i should like to try a race with our two yachts in an open sea electricity against steam what do you say with pleasure and santoris looked amused but as i am sure to be the winner you must give me the privilege of entertaining you all to dinner afterwards is that settled certainly you are hospitality itself santoris and mr harland shook him warmly by the hand what time shall we start the race suppose we say noon agreed we then prepared to go i turned to santoris and in a quiet voice thanked him for his kindness in escorting me to loch Corisk and for the pleasant afternoon we had passed the conventional words of common courtesy seemed to myself quite absurd however they had to be uttered and he accepted them with the usual conventional acknowledgment when i was just about to descend the companion ladder he asked me to wait a moment and going down to the saloon brought me the bunch of madonna lilies i had found in that special cabin which as he had said was destined for a princess you will take these i hope he said simply i raised my eyes to his as i received the white blossoms from his hand there was something indefinable and fleeting in his expression and for a moment it seemed as if we had suddenly become strangers a sense of loss and pain affected me such as happens when someone to whom we are deeply attached assumes a cold and distant air for which we can render no explanation he turned from me as quickly as i from him and i descended the companion ladder followed by mr harland in a few seconds we had put several boat lengths between ourselves and the dream and a rush of foolish tears to my eyes blurred the figure of santoris 
as he lifted his cap to us in courteous adieu. I thought Mr. Harland glanced at me a little inquisitively, but he said nothing, and we were soon on board the Diana, where Catherine, stretched out in a deck chair, watched our arrival with but languid interest. Dr. Braille was beside her, and looked up as we drew near with a supercilious smile. "'So the electric man has not quite made away with you,' he said carelessly. "'Miss Harland and I had our doubts as to whether we should ever see you again.' Mr. Harland's fuzzy eyebrows drew together in a marked frown of displeasure. "'Indeed?' he ejaculated dryly. "'Well, you need have no fears on that score. The electric man, as you call Mr. Santoris, is an excellent host, and has no sinister designs on his friends.' "'Are you quite sure of that?' And Braille, with an elaborate show of courtesy, set chairs for his patron and for me near Catherine. Derek tells me that the electric appliances on board his yacht are to him of a terrifying character, and that he would not risk passing so much as one night on such a vessel. Mr. Harland laughed. I must talk to Derek, he said. Then, approaching his daughter, he asked her kindly if she was better. She replied in the affirmative, but with some little pettishness. My nerves are all unstrung, she said. I think that friend of yours is one of those persons who draw all vitality out of everybody else. There are such people, you know, father. People who, when they are getting old and feeble, go about taking stores of fresh life out of others. He looked amused. You are full of fancies, Catherine, he said, and no logical reasoning will ever argue you out of them. Santoris is all right. For one thing, he gave me great relief from pain today. "'Ah, how was that?' And Braille looked up sharply with sudden interest. "'I don't know how,' replied Harland. "'A drop or two of harmless-looking fluid worked wonders for me, "'and in a few moments I felt almost well. "'He tells me my illness is not incurable.' A curious expression, difficult to define, flitted over Braille's face. "'You had better take care,' he said curtly. "'Invalids should never try experiments.' I'm surprised that a man in your condition should take any drug from the hand of a stranger. Most dangerous, interpolated Catherine, feebly. How could you, father? Well, Santoris isn't quite a stranger, said Mr. Harland. After all, I knew him at college. You think you knew him, put in Braille. He may not be the same man. He is the same man, answered Mr. Harland, rather testily. There are no two of his kind in the world. Braille lifted his eyebrows with a mildly affected air of surprise. I thought you had your doubts. Of course, I had and have my doubts concerning everybody and everything, said Mr. Harland. And I suppose I shall have them to the end of my days. I have sometimes doubted even your good intentions toward me. A dark flush overspread Braille's face suddenly, and as suddenly paled. He laughed a little forcedly. "'I hardly think you have any reason to do so,' he said. Mr. Harland did not answer, but turning round addressed me. "'You enjoyed yourself at Loch Corisk, didn't you?' "'Indeed I did,' I replied with emphasis. "'It was a lovely scene, never to be forgotten.' "'You and Mr. Santoris would be sure to get on well together,' said Catherine, rather crossly. "'Birds of a feather, you know.' I smiled. I was too much taken up with my own thoughts to pay attention to her evident ill-humour. I was aware that Dr. Braille watched me furtively, and with a suspicious air, and there was a curious feeling of constraint in the atmosphere that made me feel I had somehow displeased my hostess. But the matter seemed to me too trifling to consider, and as soon as the conversation became general, I took the opportunity to slip away and get down to my cabin where I locked the door and gave myself up to the freedom of my own meditations. They were at first bewildered and chaotic. But gradually my mind smoothed itself out like the sea I had looked upon in my vision, and I began to arrange and connect the various incidents of my strange experience in a more or less coherent form. According to psychic consciousness, I knew what they all meant, but according to merely material and earthly reasoning, 
they were utterly incomprehensible. If I listened to the explanation offered by my inner self, it was this. That Rafael Santoris and I had known each other for ages, longer than we were permitted to remember. That the brain pictures, or rather soul pictures, presented to me were only a few selected out of thousands which equally concerned us and which were stored up among eternal records, and that these few were only recalled to remind me of circumstances which I might erroneously think were all entirely forgotten. If, on the other hand, I preferred to accept what would be called a reasonable and practical solution of the enigma, I would say that, being imaginative and sensitive, I had been easily hypnotized by a stronger will than my own, and that for his amusement, or because he had seen in me the possibility of a test case. Santoris had tried his power upon me, and forced me to see whatever he chose to conjure up, in order to bewilder and perplex me. But if this were so, what could be his object? If I were indeed an utter stranger to him, why should he take this trouble? I found myself harassed by anxiety, and dragged between two opposing influences— one which impelled me to yield myself to the deep sense of exquisite happiness, peace, and consolation that swept over my spirit like the touch of a veritable benediction from heaven, the other which pushed me back against a hard wall of impregnable fact and bade me suspect my dawning joy as though it were a foe. That night we were a curious party at dinner. Never were five human beings more oddly brought into contact and conversation with each other. We were absolutely opposed at all points, in thought, in feeling, and in sentiment. I could not help remembering the wonderful network of shining lines I had seen in that first dream of mine, lines which were apparently mathematically designed to meet in reciprocal unity. The lines on this occasion between us five human beings were an almost visible tangle. I found my best refuge in silence and I listened in vague wonderment to the flow of senseless small talk poured out by Dr. Braille, apparently for the amusement of Catherine, who on her part seemed suddenly possessed by a spirit of willfulness and enforced gaiety, which moved her to utter a great many foolish things, things which she evidently imagined were clever. There is nothing perhaps more embarrassing than to hear a woman of mature years giving herself away by the childish vapidness of her talk and exhibiting not only a lack of mental poise, but also utter tactlessness. However, Catherine rattled on, and Dr. Braille rattled with her. Mr. Harland threw in occasional monosyllables, but for the most part was evidently caught in a kind of dusty spider's web of thought, and I spoke not at all unless spoken to. Presently I met Catherine's eyes fixed upon me with a sort of round, half-malicious curiosity. I think your day's outing has done you good, she said. You look wonderfully well. I am well, I answered her. I have been well all the time. Yes, but you haven't looked as you look tonight, she said. You have quite a transformed air. Transformed, I echoed, smiling. In what way? Mr. Harlan turned and surveyed me critically. Upon my word, I think Catherine is right, he said. There is something different about you, though I cannot explain what it is. I felt the color rising hotly to my face, but I endeavored to appear unconcerned. You look, said Dr. Braille, with a quick glance from his narrowly set eyes, as if you had been through a happy experience. Perhaps I have, I answered quietly. It has certainly been a very happy day. What is your opinion of Santoris? asked Mr. Harland suddenly. You've spent a couple of hours alone in his company. You must have formed some idea. I replied at once without taking thought. I think him quite an exceptional man, I said. Good and great-hearted, and I fancy he must have gone through much difficult experience to make him what he is. I entirely disagree with you, said Dr. Braille quickly. I've taken his measure, and I think it's a fairly correct one. I believe him to be a very clever and subtle charlatan who affects a certain profound mysticism in order to give himself undue importance. There was a sudden clash. 
Mr. Harland had brought his clenched fist down upon the table with a force that made the glasses ring. "'I won't have that, Braille,' he said sharply. "'I tell you, I won't have it. Santorus is no charlatan, never was. He won his honours at Oxford like a man. His conduct all the time I ever knew him was perfectly open and blameless. He did no mean tricks, and pandered to nothing base. And if some of us fellows were frightened of him, as we were, it was because he did everything better than we could do it, and was superior to us all. That's the truth, and there's no getting over it. Nothing gives small minds a better handle for hatred than superiority, especially when that superiority is never asserted, but only felt. "'You surprise me,' murmured Braille, half apologetically. "'I thought—' "'Never mind what you thought,' said Mr. Harland, with a sudden ugly irritation of manner that sometimes disfigured him. "'Your thoughts are not of the least importance.' Dr. Braille flushed angrily and Catherine looked surprised and visibly indignant. "'Father, how can you be so rude?' "'Am I rude?' And Mr. Harland shrugged his shoulders indifferently. "'Well, I may be, but I never take a man's hospitality and permit myself to listen to abuse of him afterwards.' "'I assure you,' began Dr. Braille, almost humbly. "'There, there, if I spoke hastily, I apologize.' but Santorus is too straightforward a man to be suspected of any dishonesty or chicanery, and certainly no one on board this vessel shall treat his name with anything but respect. Here he turned to me. Will you come on deck for a little while before bedtime, or would you rather rest? I saw that he wished to speak to me, and willingly agreed to accompany him. Dinner being well over, we left the saloon, and were soon pacing the deck together under the light of a brilliant moon. Instinctively, we both looked towards the dream yacht. There was no illumination about her this evening, save the usual lamp hung in the rigging, and the tiny gleams of radiance through her portholes. And her graceful masts and spars were like fine black pencilings seen against the bare slope of a mountain, made almost silver to the summit by the singularly searching clearness of the moonbeams. My host paused in his walk beside me to light a cigar. "'I'm sure you are convinced that Santorus is honest,' he said. "'Are you not?' "'In what way should I doubt him?' I replied evasively. "'I scarcely know him.' Hardly had I said this when a sudden self-reproach stung me. How dare I say that I scarcely knew one who had been known to me for ages— I leaned against the deck rail, looking up at the violet sky, my heart beating quickly. My companion was still busy lighting his cigar, but when this was done to his satisfaction, he resumed. True, you scarcely know him, but you are quick to form opinions, and your instincts are often, though perhaps not always, correct. At any rate, you have no distrust of him. You like him? Yes, I answered slowly. I... I like him very much. And the violet sky, with its round white moon, seemed to swing in a circle about me as I spoke, knowing that the true answer of my heart was love, not liking, that love was the magnet drawing me irresistibly, despite my own endeavor, to something I could neither understand nor imagine. I'm glad of that, said Mr. Harland. It would have worried me a little if you had taken a prejudice or felt any antipathy towards him. I can see that Braille hates him, and has imbued Catherine with something of his own dislike. I was silent. He is, of course, an extraordinary man, went on Mr. Harland, and he is bound to offend many and to please few. He is not likely to escape the usual fate of unusual characters. But I think, indeed, I may say I am sure, his integrity is beyond question. He has curious opinions about love and marriage, almost as curious as the fixed ideas he holds concerning life and death. Something cold seemed to send a shiver through my blood. Was it some stray fragment of memory from the past that stirred me to a sense of pain? I forced myself to speak. What are those opinions? I asked, and looking up in the moonlight to my companion's face, I saw that it wore a puzzled expression. Hardly conventional, I suppose. 
conventional convention and santoris are farther apart than the poles no he doesn't fit into any accepted social code at all he looks upon marriage itself as a tacit acknowledgment of inconstancy in love and declares that if the passion existed in its truest form between man and woman any sort of formal or legal tie would be needless as love if it be love does not and cannot change but it is no use discussing such a matter with him the love that he believes in can only exist if then once in a thousand years men and women marry for physical attraction convenience necessity or respectability and the legal bond is necessary both for their sakes and the worldly welfare of the children born to them but love which is physical and transcendental together love that is to last through an imagined eternity of progress and fruition this is a mere dream a chimera and he feasts his brain upon it as though it were a nourishing fact however one must have patience with him he is not like the rest of us no i murmured and then stood silently beside him watching the moonbeams ripple on the waters in wavy links of brightness when you married i said at last did you not marry for love he puffed at his cigar thoughtfully well i hardly know he replied after a long pause looking back upon everything i rather doubt it i married as most men marry on impulse i saw a pretty face and it seemed advisable that i should marry but i cannot say i was moved by any great or absorbing passion for the woman i chose she was charming and amiable in our courting days as a wife she became peevish and querulous apt to sulk too and she devoted herself almost entirely to the most commonplace routine of life however i had nothing to justly complain of we lived five years together before her child catherine was born and then she died i cannot say that either her life or her death left any deep mark upon me not if i am honest i don't think i understand love certainly not the love which raphael santoris looks upon as the secret key of the universe instinctively my eyes turned toward the dream at anchor she looked like a phantom vessel in the moonlight again the faint shiver of cold ran through my veins like a sense of spiritual terror if i should lose now what i had lost before this was my chief thought my hidden shuddering fear did the whole responsibility rest with me i wondered mr harland laid his hand kindly on my arm you look like a wan spirit in the moonbeams he said so pale and wistful you are tired and i am selfish in keeping you up here to talk to me go down to your cabin i can see you are full of mystical dreams and i am afraid santoris has rather helped you to indulge in them he is of the same nature as you are inclined to believe that this life as we live it is only one phase of many that are past and of many yet to come i wish i could accept that faith i wish you could i said you surely would be happier should i he gave a quick sigh i have my doubts if i could be young and strong and live through many lives always possessed of that same youth and strength then there would be something in it but to be old and ailing no the faust legend is an eternal truth life is only worth living as long as we enjoy it your friend santoris enjoys it i said ah there you touch me he does enjoy it and why because he is young though nearly as old in years as i am he is actually young that's the mystery of him santoris is positively young young in heart young in thought ambition feeling and sentiment and yet he broke off for a moment then resumed i don't know how he has managed it but he told me long ago that it was a man's own fault if he allowed himself to grow old i laughed at him then but he has certainly carried his theories into fact he used to declare that it was either yourself or your friends that made you old you will find he said as you go on in years that your family relations or your professing dear friends are those that will chiefly insist on your inviting and accepting the burden of age they will remind you that twenty years ago you did so and so or that they have known you over thirty years or they will tell you that considering your age you look well 
or a thousand and one things of that kind, as if it were a fault or even a crime to be alive for a certain span of time. Whereas, if you simply shook off such unnecessary attentions and went your own way, taking freely of the constant output of life and energy supplied to you by nature, you would outwit all these croakers of feebleness and decay and renew your vital forces to the end. But to do this, you must have a constant aim in life and a ruling passion. As I told you, I laughed at him and at what I called his folly. But now, well, now it's a case of let those laugh who win. And you think he has won? I asked. Most assuredly, I cannot deny it. But the secret of his victory is beyond me. I should think it is beyond most people, I replied. For if we could all keep ourselves young and strong, we would take every means in our power to attain such happiness. Would we, though? And his brows knitted perplexedly. If we knew, would we take the necessary trouble? We will hardly obey a physician's orders for our own good, even when we are really ill. Would we, in health, follow any code of life in order to keep well? I laughed. Perhaps not, I said. I expect it will always be the same thing. Many are called, but few are chosen. Good night. I held out my hand. He took it in his own and kept it a moment. It's curious we should have met Santorus so soon after my telling you about him, he said. It's one of those coincidences which one cannot explain. You are very like him in some of your ideas. You two ought to be very good friends. Ought we? And I smiled. Perhaps we shall be. Again, good night. Good night. And I left him to his meditations and went down to my cabin only stopping for a moment to say good-night to Catherine and Dr. Braille, who were playing bridge with Mr. Swinton and Captain Derrick in the saloon. Once in my room, I was thankful to be alone. Every extraneous thing seemed an intrusion or an impertinence. The thoughts that filled my brain were all absorbing, and went so far beyond the immediate radius of time and space that I could hardly follow their flight. I smiled as I imagined what ordinary people would think of the experience through which I had passed and was passing. Foolish fancies, neurotic folly, and other epithets of the kind would be heaped upon me if they knew. They, the excellent folk whose sole objects in life are so ephemeral as to be the things of the hour, the day, or the month merely, and who, if they ever pause to consider eternal possibilities at all, do so reluctantly, perhaps in church on Sundays, comfortably dismissing them for the more solid prospect of dinner. And of love? What view of the divine passion do they take as a rule? Let the millions of mistaken marriages answer. Let the savage lusts and treacheries and cruelties of merely brutish and unspiritualized humanity bear witness. And how few shall be found who have even the beginnings of the nature of true love the love of soul for soul, angel for angel, God for God, the love that accepts this world and its events as one phase only of divine and immortal existence, a phase of trial and proving in which the greater number fail to pass even a first examination. As for myself, I felt and knew that I had failed hopelessly and utterly in the past and I stood now, as it were, on the edge of new circumstances, in fear, yet not without hope, and praying that whatsoever should chance to me, I might not fail again. End of chapter 9、10. Of the Life Everlasting by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lisa Statler. Strange Associations. The next day, the race agreed upon was run in the calmest of calm weather. There was not the faintest breath of wind. The sea was still as a pond and almost oily in its smooth, motionless shining and it was evident at first that our captain entertained no doubt whatever 
as to the Diana, with her powerful engines, being easily able to beat the aerial-looking dream schooner, which at noonday, with all sail spread, came gliding up beside us till she lay point to point at equal distance and at nearly equal measurement with our more cumbersome vessel. Mr. Harland was keenly excited. Dr. Braille was ready to lay any amount of wagers as to the impossibility of a sailing vessel, even granted she was moved by electricity, outracing one of steam in such a dead calm. As the two vessels lay on the still waters, the Diana fussily getting up steam, and the dream with sails full out as if in a stiff breeze, despite the fact that there was no wind, we discussed the situation eagerly. Or rather, I should say my host and his people discussed it, for I had nothing to say, knowing that the victory was sure to be with Santorus. We were in very lonely waters, there was room and to spare for plenty of racing, and when all was ready, and Santorus saluted us from the deck, lifting his cap and waving it in response to a similar greeting from Mr. Harland and our skipper, the signal to start was given. We moved off together, and for at least half an hour or more the dream floated along in a kind of lazy indolence, keeping up with us easily, her canvas filled, and her keel cutting the water as if swept by a favoring gale. The result of the race was soon a foregone conclusion, for presently, when well out on the mirror-like calm of the sea, the dream showed her secret powers in earnest, and flew like a bird with a silent swiftness that was almost incredible. Our yacht put on all steam in the effort to keep up with her, in vain. On, on, with light grace and celerity, her white sails carried her like the wings of a seagull, and almost before we could realize it, she vanished altogether from our sight. I saw a waste of water spread around us, emptily, like a wide circle of crystal reflecting the sky, and a sense of desolation fell upon me in the mere fact that we were temporarily left alone. We steamed on and on in the direction of the vanished dream, our movements suggesting those of some clumsy four-footed animal panting its way after a bird, but unable to come up with her. Wonderful, said Mr. Harland at last, drawing a long breath. I would never have believed it possible. Nor I, agreed Captain Derrick. I certainly thought she would never have managed it in such a dead calm, for though I have seen some of her mechanism, I cannot entirely understand it. Dr. Braille was silent. It was evident that he was annoyed, though why he should be so was not apparent. I myself was full of secret anxiety, for the dream yacht's sudden and swift disappearance had filled me with a wretched sense of loneliness beyond all expression. Suppose she should not return. I had no clue to her whereabouts, and with the loss of Santorus I knew I should lose all that was worth having in my life. While these miserable thoughts were yet chasing each other through my brain, I suddenly caught a far glimpse of white sails on the horizon. "'She's coming back!' I cried, enraptured, and heedless of what I said. "'Oh, thank God! She's coming back!' They all looked at me in amazement. "'Why, what's the matter with you?' asked Mr. Harland, smiling. "'You surely didn't think she was in any danger?' My cheeks grew warm. "'I didn't know. I could not imagine,' I faltered, and turning away, I met Dr. Braille's eyes fixed upon me with a gleam of malice in them. "'I'm sure,' he said suavely, "'you are greatly interested in Mr. Santoris. Perhaps you have met each other before.' "'Never,' I answered hurriedly, and then checked myself, startled and confused. He kept his narrow brown eyes heedfully upon me and smiled slightly. "'Really? I should have thought otherwise.' I did not trouble myself to reply. The white sails of the dream were coming nearer and nearer over the smooth width of the sunlit water, and as she approached, my heart grew warm with gratitude. Life was again a thing of joy. The world was no longer empty. That ship looked to me like a beautiful, winged spirit coming toward me with radiant assurances of hope and consolation. And I lost all fear, all sadness, all foreboding, as she gradually swept up alongside in the easy triumph she had won. 
Our crew assembled to welcome her, and cheered lustily. Santoris, standing on her deck, lightly acknowledged the salutes which gave him the victory, and presently both our vessels were once more at their former places of anchorage. When all the excitement was over, I went down to my cabin to rest for a while before dressing for the dinner on board the dream, to which we were all invited. And while I lay on my sofa reading, Catherine Harland knocked at my door and asked to come in. I admitted her at once, and she flung herself into an armchair with a gesture of impatience. "'I'm so tired of all this yachting,' she said peevishly. "'It isn't amusing to me.' "'I'm very sorry,' I answered. "'If you feel like that, why not give it up at once?' "'Oh, it's father's whim,' she said. "'And if he makes up his mind, there's no moving him. "'One thing, however, I'm determined to do, and that is—' "'Here she stopped.' looking at me curiously. I returned her gaze questioningly. And that is, what? To get as far away as ever we can from that terrible dream yacht and its owner, she replied. That man is a devil. I laughed. I could not help laughing. The estimate she had formed of one so vastly her superior as Santoris struck me as more amusing than blamable. I am often accustomed to hear the hasty and narrow verdict of small-minded and unintelligent persons pronounced on men and women of high attainment and great mental ability. Therefore, that she should show herself as not above the level of the common majority did not offend so much as it entertained me. However, my laughter made her suddenly angry. "'Why do you laugh?' she demanded. "'You look quite pagan in that lace rest-gown.' I suppose you call it a rest-gown, with all your hair tumbling loose about you. And that laugh of yours is a pagan laugh. I was so surprised at her odd way of speaking that for a moment I could find no words. She looked at me with a kind of hard disfavor in her eyes. That's the reason, she went on, why you find life agreeable. Pagans always did. They reveled in sunshine and open air and found all sorts of excuses for their own faults provided they got some pleasure out of them. That's quite your temperament. And they laughed at serious things, just as you do. The mirror showed me my own reflection, and I saw myself still smiling. Do I laugh at serious things? I said. Dear Miss Harland, I am not aware of it. But I cannot take Mr. Santoris as a devil seriously. He is! And she nodded her head emphatically. And all those queer beliefs he holds, and you hold them too, are devilish. If you belonged to the Church of Rome, you would not be allowed to indulge in such wicked theories for a moment. Ah, the Church of Rome fortunately cannot control thought, I said, not even the thoughts of its own children. And some of the beliefs of the Church of Rome are more blasphemous and barbarous than all the paganism of the ancient world. Tell me, what are my wicked theories? "'Oh, I don't know,' she replied, vaguely and inconsequently. "'You believe there's no death, and you think we all make our own illnesses and misfortunes, and I've heard you say that the idea of eternal punishment is absurd. So, in a way, you are as bad as Father, who declares there's nothing in the universe but gas and atoms, no God and no anything. You really are quite as much of an atheist as he is. Dr. Braille says so.' I had been standing in front of her while she thus talked, but now I resumed my former reclining attitude on the sofa, and looked at her with a touch of disdain. "'Dr. Braille says so,' I repeated. "'Dr. Braille's opinion is the least worth having in the world. Now, if you really believe in devils, there's one for you.' "'How can you say so?' she exclaimed hotly. "'What right have you?' "'How can he call me an atheist?' I demanded. What right has he to judge me? The flush died off her face, and a sudden fear filled her eyes. Don't look at me like that, she said, almost in a whisper. It reminds me of an awful dream I had the other night. She paused. Shall I tell it to you? I nodded indifferently, yet watched her curiously the while. Something in her hard, plain face had become suddenly and unpleasantly familiar. I dreamed that I was in a painter's studio watching two murdered people die, a man and a woman. The man was like Santoris. The woman resembled you. They had been stabbed, and the woman was clinging to the man's body. 
Dr. Brail stood beside me, also watching. But the scene was strange to me, and the clothes we wore were all of some ancient time. I said to Dr. Brail, We have killed them, and he replied, Yes, they are better dead than living. It was a horrible dream. It seemed so real. I have been frightened of you and of that man Santorus ever since. I could not speak for a moment. A recollection swept over me, to which I dared not give utterance. It seemed too impossible. I've had nerves, she went on, shivering a little. And that's why I say I'm tired of this yachting trip. It's becoming a nightmare to me. I lay back on the sofa, looking at her with a kind of pity. Then why not end it, I said, or why not let me go away? It is I who have displeased you somehow, and I assure you I'm very sorry. You and Mr. Harland have both been most kind to me. I've been your guest for nearly a fortnight. That's quite sufficient holiday for me. Put me ashore anywhere you like, and I'll go home and get myself out of your way. Will that be any comfort to you? I don't know that it will, she said with a short querulous sigh. Things have happened so strangely. She paused, looking at me. Yes, you have the face of that woman I saw in my dream, and you have always reminded me of... I waited eagerly. She seemed afraid to go on. Well, I said, as quietly as I could, do please finish what you were saying. It goes back to the time when I first saw you, she continued, now speaking quickly, as though anxious to get it over. You will perhaps hardly remember the occasion. It was at that great art and society crush in London, where there was such a crowd that hundreds of people never got farther than the staircase. You were pointed out to me as a psychist, and while I was still listening to what was being said about you, my father came up with you on his arm and introduced us. When I saw you, I felt that your features were somehow familiar, though I could not tell where I had met you before, and I became very anxious to see more of you. In fact, you had a perfect fascination for me. You have the same fascination now, only it is a fascination that terrifies me. I was silent. The other night, she went on, when Mr. Santoris first came on board, I had a singular impression that he was or had been an enemy of mine. The where or how I could not say. It was this that frightened me and made me too ill and nervous to go with you on that excursion to Loch Corisk and I want to get away from him. I never had such impressions before, and even now, looking at you, I feel there's something in you which is quite uncanny. It troubles me. Oh, I'm sure you mean me no harm. You are bright and amiable and adaptable and all that, but I'm afraid of you. Poor Catherine, I said very gently. These are merely nervous ideas. There is nothing to fear from me. No, nothing. For here she suddenly leaned forward and took my hand, looking earnestly in my face. How can you imagine such a thing possible? Are you sure? she half whispered. When I called you pagan just now, I had a sort of dim recollection of a fair woman like you, a woman I seemed to know who was really a pagan. Yet I don't know how I knew her or where I met her, a woman who, for some reason or other, was hateful to me because I was jealous of her. These curious fancies have haunted my mind only since that man Santoris came on board, and I told Dr. Braille exactly what I felt. And what did he say? I asked. He said that it was all the work of Santoris, who was an evident professor of psychical imposture. I sprang up. Let him say that to me, I exclaimed. Let him dare to say it and I will prove who was the impostor to his face. She retreated from me with wide-open eyes of alarm. Why do you look at me like that? she said. We didn't really kill you, except in a dream. A sudden silence fell between us. Something cold and shadowy and impalpable seemed to possess the very air. If by some supernatural agency we had been momentarily deprived of life and motion, while a vast dark cloud heavy with rain, had made its slow way betwixt us, the sense of chill and depression could hardly have been greater. Presently, Catherine spoke again, with a little forced laugh. What silly things I say, she murmured. You can see for yourself my nerves are in a bad state. I am altogether unstrung. I stood for a moment looking at her, 
and considering the perplexity in which we both seemed involved. "'If you would rather not dine with Mr. Santoris this evening,' I said at last, "'and if you think his presence has a bad effect on you, let us make some excuse not to go. I will willingly stay with you if you wish me to do so.' She gave me a surprised glance. "'You are very unselfish,' she said, "'and I wish I were not so fanciful. It's most kind of you to offer to stay with me, and to give up an evening's pleasure. For I suppose it is a pleasure. You like Mr. Santoris. The colour rushed to my face in a warm glow. Yes, I answered, turning slightly away from her. I like him very much. And he likes you better than he likes any of us, she said. In fact, I believe, if it had not been for you, we should never have met him in this strange way. "'Why, how can you make that out?' I asked, smiling. "'I had never heard of him till your father spoke of him, "'and I never saw him till—' "'Till when?' she demanded quickly. "'Till the other night,' I answered, hesitatingly. "'She searched my face with questioning eyes. "'I thought you were going to say that you, like myself, "'had some idea or recollection of having met him before,' she said. However, I shall not ask you to sacrifice your pleasure for me. In fact, I have made up my mind to go to this dinner, though Dr. Braille doesn't wish it. Oh, Dr. Braille doesn't wish it? I echoed. And why? Well, he thinks it will not be good for me, and, and he hates the very sight of Santoris. I said nothing. She rose to leave my cabin. Please don't think too hardly of me, she said pleadingly. I've told you frankly just how I feel, and you can imagine how glad I shall be when this yachting trip comes to an end. She went away then, and I stood for some minutes lost in thought. I dared not pursue the train of memories with which she had connected herself in my mind. My chief idea now was to find some convenient method of immediately concluding my stay with the Harlands, and leaving their yacht at some easy point of departure for home and I resolved I would speak to Santoris on this subject, and trust to him for a means whereby we should not lose sight of each other, for I felt that this was imperative. And my spirit rose up within me full of joy and pride in its instinctive consciousness that I was as necessary to him as he was to me. It was a warm, almost sultry evening, and I was able to discard my serge yachting dress for one of soft white Indian silk, a cooler and more presentable costume for a dinner party on board a yacht, which was furnished with such luxury as was the dream. My little sprig of bell heather still looked bright and fresh in the glass where I always kept it. But tonight, when I took it in my hand, it suddenly crumbled into a pinch of fine grey dust. This sudden destruction of what had seemed well-nigh indestructible startled me for a moment till I began to think that, after all, the little bunch of blossom had done its work. Its message had been given, its errand completed. All the Madonna lilies Santoris had given me were as fresh as if newly gathered, and I chose one of these with its companion bud as my only ornament. When I joined my host and his party in the saloon, he looked at me with inquisitive scrutiny. "'I cannot quite make you out,' he said. "'You look several years younger than you did when you came on board at Rothsay. "'Is it the sea air, the sunshine, or Santoris?' "'Santoris,' I repeated and laughed. "'How can it be Santoris?' "'Well, he makes himself young,' Mr. Harland answered. "'And perhaps he may make others young, too. "'There's no telling the extent of his powers.' "'Quite the conjurer,' observed Dr. Braille, dryly. Faust should have consulted him instead of Mephistopheles. Faust is a wonderful legend, but absurd in the fact that the old philosopher sold his soul to the devil merely for the love of woman, said Mr. Harland. The joy, the sensation, and the passion of love were to him supreme temptation and the only satisfaction on earth. Dr. Braille's eyes gleamed. But after all, is this not a truth? he asked. Is there anything that so completely dominates the life of a man as the love of a woman? It is very seldom the right woman, but it is always a woman of some kind. Everything that has ever been done in the world, either good or evil, 
can be traced back to the influence of women on men sometimes it is their wives who sway their actions but it is far more often their mistresses kings and emperors are as prone to the universal weakness as commoners we have only to read history to be assured of the fact what more could faust desire than love well to me love is a mistake said mr harland throwing on his overcoat carelessly i agree with byron's dictum who loves raves of course it should be an ideal passion but it never is come are we all ready we were and we at once left the yacht in our own launch our party consisted of mr harland his daughter myself dr braille and mr swinton and with such indifferent companions i imagined it would be difficult if not impossible to get even a moment with santoris alone to tell him of my intention to leave my host and hostess as soon as might be possible however i determined to make some effort in this direction if i could find even the briefest opportunity we made our little trip across the water from the diana to the dream in the light of a magnificent sunset loch scavig was a blaze of burning colour and the skies above us were flushed with deep rows divided by lines of palest blue and warm gold santoris was waiting on the deck to receive us attended by his captain and one or two of the principals of the crew but what attracted and charmed our eyes at the moment was a beautiful dark youth of some twelve or thirteen years of age clad in eastern dress who held a basket full of crimson and white rose petals which with a graceful gesture he silently emptied at our feet as we stepped on board i happened to be the first one to ascend the companion ladder so that it looked as if this fragrant heap of delicate leaves had been thrown down for me to tread upon but even if it had been so intended it appeared as though designed for the whole party santoris welcomed us with a kindly courtesy which always distinguished his manner and he himself escorted miss harland down to one of the cabins there to take off the numerous unnecessary wraps and shawls with which she invariably clothed herself on the warmest day i followed them as they went and he turned to me with a smile saying you know your room the same you had yesterday afternoon i obeyed his gesture and entered the exquisitely designed and furnished apartment which he had said was for a princess and closing the door i sat down for a few minutes to think quietly it was evident that things were coming to some sort of crisis in my life and shaping to some destiny which i must either accept or avoid decisive action would rest as i saw entirely with myself to avoid all difficulty i had only to hold my peace and go my own way refuse to know more of this singular man who seemed to be so mysteriously connected with my life and return home to the usual safe if dull routine of my ordinary round of work and effort on the other hand to accept the dawning joy that seemed showering upon me like a light from heaven was to blindly move on into the unknown to trust unquestioningly to the secret spiritual promptings of my own nature and to give myself up wholly and ungrudgingly to a love which suggested all things yet promised nothing full of the most conflicting thoughts i paced the room up and down slowly the tall mirror reflected my face and figure and showed me the startlingly faithful presentment of the woman i had seen in my strange series of visions the woman who centuries ago had fought against convention and custom only to be foolishly conquered by them in a thousand ways the woman who had slain love only that it should rise again and confront her with deathless eyes of eternal remembrance the woman who drowned at last for love's sake in a sea of wrath and trembling knelt outside the barred gate of heaven praying to enter in and in my mind i heard again the words spoken by that sweet and solemn voice which had addressed me in the first of my dreams one rose from all the roses in heaven one fadeless and immortal only one but sufficient for all one love from all the millions of loves of men and women 
one but enough for eternity how long the rose has awaited its flowering how long the love has awaited its fulfilment only the recording angels know such roses bloom but once in the wilderness of space and time such love comes but once in a universe of worlds and then i remembered the parting command rise and go hence keep the gift god sends thee take that which is thine meet that which hath sought thee sorrowing for many centuries turn not aside again neither by thine own will nor by the will of others lest old errors prevail pass from vision into waking from night to day from seeming death to life from loneliness to love and keep within thy heart the message of a dream dared i trust to these suggestions which the worldly wise would call mere imagination a profound philosopher of these latter days has defined imagination as an advanced perception of truth and avers that the discoveries of the future can always be predicted by the poet and the seer whose receptive brains are the first to catch the premonitions of those finer issues of thought which emanate from the divine intelligence however this may be my own experience of life had taught me that what ordinary persons pin their faith upon as real is often unreal while such promptings of the soul are as almost incapable of expression lead to the highest realities of existence and i decided at last to let matters take their own course though i was absolutely resolved to get away from the harlands within the next two or three days i meant to ask mr harland to land me at portree where i could take the steamer for glasgow any excuse would serve for a hurried departure and i felt now that departure was necessary a soft sound of musical bells reached my ears at this moment announcing dinner and leaving the princess's apartment i met santoris at the entrance to the saloon there was no one else there for the moment but himself and as i came towards him he took my hands in his own and raised them to his lips you are not yet resolved he said in a low tone smiling take plenty of time I lifted my eyes to his, and all doubt seemed swept away in the light of our mutual glances. I smiled in response to his look, and we loosened our hands quickly as Mr. Harland, with his doctor and secretary, came down from the deck. Catherine joining us from the cabin, where she had disburdened herself of her invalid wrappings. She was rather more elegantly attired than usual. She wore a curious purple-colored gown, with threads of gold interwoven in the stuff and a collar of lace turned back at the throat gave her the aspect of an old italian picture a sort of portrait of a lady artist unknown not a pleasant portrait perhaps but characteristic of a certain dull and self-centred type of woman we were soon seated at table a table richly yet daintily appointed and adorned with the costliest flowers and fruits the men who waited upon us were all Easterns, dark-eyed and dark-skinned, and wore the Eastern dress. All their movements were swift yet graceful and dignified. They made no noise in the business of serving. Not a dish clattered, not a glass clashed. They were perfect servants, taking care to avoid the common but reprehensible method of offering dishes to persons conversing, thus interrupting the flow of talk at inopportune moments. And what talk it was! All sorts of subjects, social and impersonal, came up for discussion, and Santoris handled them with such skill that he made us forget that there was anything remarkable or unusual about himself or his surroundings, though, as a matter of fact, no more princely banquet could ever have been served in the most luxurious of palaces. Halfway through the meal, when the conversation came for a moment to a pause, the most exquisite music charmed our ears. Beginning softly and far away, it swelled out to rich and glorious harmonies, like a full orchestra playing under the sea. We looked at each other, and then at our host in charmed inquiry. "'Electricity again,' he said, so simply managed that it is not worth talking about. 
Unfortunately, it is mechanical music, and this can never be like the music evolved from brain and fingers. However, it fills in gaps of silence when conventional minds are at a strain for something to say, something quite safe and unlikely to provoke discussion. His keen blue eyes flashed with a sudden gleam of scorn in them. I looked at him half questioningly, and the scorn melted into a smile. It isn't good form to start any subject which might lead to argument, he went on. The modern brain must not be exercised too strenuously. It is not strong enough to stand much effort. What do you say, Harland? I agree, answered Mr. Harland. As a rule, people who dine as well as we are dining tonight have no room left for mentality. They become all digestion. Dr. Braille laughed. Nothing like a good dinner if one has an appetite for it. I think it quite possible that Faust would have left his Margaret for a full meal. I'm sure he would, chimed in Mr. Swinton. Any man would. Santoris looked down the table with a curious air of half-amused inspection. His eyes, clear and searching in their swift glance, took in the whole group of us. Mr. Harland enjoying succulent asparagus, Dr. Braille drinking champagne, Mr. Swinton helping himself out of some dish of good things offered to him by one of the servants, Catherine playing in a sort of demure old maidish way with a knife and fork, as if she were eating against her will. And finally they rested on me, to whom the dinner was just a pretty pageant of luxury, in which I scarcely took any part. Well, whatever Faust would or would not do, he said, half laughingly, it's certain that food is never at a discount. Women frequently are. Women, said Mr. Harland, poising a stem of asparagus in the air, are so constituted as to invariably make havoc either of themselves or of the men they profess to love. Wives neglect their husbands, and husbands naturally desert their wives. Devoted lovers quarrel and part over the merest trifles. The whole thing is a mistake. What whole thing? asked Santoris, smiling. The relations between man and woman, Harland answered. In my opinion, we should conduct ourselves like the birds and animals, whose relationships are neither binding nor lasting, but are just sufficient to preserve the type. That's all that is really needed. What is called love is mere sentiment. Do you endorse that verdict, Miss Harland? Santoris asked suddenly. Catherine looked up, startled. Her yellow skin flushed a pale red. I don't know, she answered. I scarcely heard... "'Your father doesn't believe in love,' he said. "'Do you?' "'I hope it exists,' she murmured. "'But nowadays people are so very practical.' "'Oh, believe me, they are no more practical now than they ever were,' averred Santoris, laughing. "'There's as much romance in the modern world as in the ancient. "'The human heart has the same passions, "'but they are more deeply suppressed and therefore more dangerous. "'And love?' holds the same eternal sway. So does jealousy. Dr. Braille looked up. Jealousy is an uncivilized thing, he said. It is a kind of primitive passion from which no well-ordered mind should suffer. Santoris smiled. Primitive passions are as forceful as they ever were, he answered. No culture can do away with them. Jealousy, like love, is one of the motive powers of progress. It is a great evil, but a necessary one, as necessary as war. Without strife of some sort, the world would become like a stagnant pool, breeding nothing but weeds and the slimy creatures pertaining to foulness. Even in love, the most divine of passions, there should be a wave of uncertainty and a sense of unsolved mystery to give it everlastingness. Everlastingness? queried Mr. Harland. Or simply, life-lastingness? Everlastingness, repeated Santoris. Love that lacks eternal stability is not love at all, but simply an affectionate understanding and agreeable companionship in this world only. For the other world or worlds? Ah, you are going too far, interrupted Mr. Harland. You know I cannot follow you, and with all due deference to the fair sex, I very much doubt if any one of them would care for a love that was destined to last for ever. No man would, interrupted Braille sarcastically. Santoris gave him a quick glance. 
no man is asked to care he said nor woman either souls are not only asked but commanded to care this however is beyond you and beyond most people answered braille such ideas are purely imaginary and transcendental granted and santoris gave him a quick straight glance but what do you mean by imaginary and transcendental imagination is the faculty of conceiving in the brain ideas which may with time spring to the full fruition of realization every item of our present-day civilization has been imagined before taking practical shape transcendental means beyond the ordinary happenings of life and life's bodily routine and this beyond expresses itself so often that there are few lives lived for a single day without some touch of its inexplicable marvel it is on such lines as these that human beings drift away from happiness they will only believe what they can see while all the time their actual lives depend on what they do not see there was a moment's silence the charm of his voice was potent and still more so the fascination of his manner and bearing and mr harland looked at him in something of wonder and appeal you are a strange fellow santoris he said at last and you always were even now i can hardly believe that you are really the very santoris that struck such terror into the hearts of some of us undergrads at oxford i say i can hardly believe it though i know you are the man but i wish you would tell me all about myself and santoris smiled i will with pleasure if the story does not bore you there is no mystery about it no black magic or occultism of any kind i have done nothing since i left college but adapt myself to the forces of nature and use them when necessary the same way of life is open to all and the same results are bound to follow results such as queried braille health youth and power answered santoris with an involuntary slight clenching of the firm well-shaped hand that rested lightly on the table command of oneself command of body command of spirit and so on through an ever ascending scale every man with the breath of god in him is a master not a slave my heart beat quickly as he spoke something rose up in me like a response to a call and i wondered did he assume to master me no i would not yield to that if yielding were necessary it must be my own free will that gave in not his compelling influence as this thought ran through my brain i met his eyes he smiled a little and i saw he had guessed my mind the warm blood rushed to my cheeks in a fervent glow nevertheless the defiance of my soul was strong as strong as the love which had begun to dominate me and i listened eagerly as he went on i began at oxford by playing the slave part he said a slave to conventions and fossil methods of instruction one can really learn more from studying the actual formation of rocks than from those worthy dons whom nothing will move out of their customary ruts of routine even at that early time i felt that given a man of health and good physical condition with sound brain sound lungs and firm nerves it was not apparent why he evidently born to rule should put himself into the leading strings of oxford or any other forcing bed of intellectual effort that it would be better if such an one took himself in hand and tried to find out his own meaning both in relation to the finite and infinite gradations of spirit and matter and i resolved to enter upon the task without allowing myself to fear failure or to hope for success my aim was to discover myself and my meaning if such a thing were possible no atom however infinitesimal is without origin history place and use in the universe and i a conglomerated mass of atoms called man resolved to search out the possibilities finite and infinite of my own entity with this aim i began with this aim i continued your task is not finished then put in dr braille with a smilingly incredulous air it will never be finished answered santoris an eternal thing has no end there was a moment's silence well go on santoris 
said Mr. Harland, with a touch of impatience, and tell us exactly what we all of us are chiefly anxious to know, how it is that you are young when according to the time of the world you should be old. Santoris smiled again. Ah, that is a purely personal touch of inquisitiveness, he answered. It is quite human and natural, of course, but not always wise. In every great lesson of life or scientific discovery, people ask first of all, how can I benefit by it? Or how will it affect me? And while asking the question, they yet will not trouble to get an answer out of themselves, but they turn to others for the solution of the mystery. To keep young is not at all difficult. When certain simple processes of nature are mastered, the difficulty is to grow old. We all sat silent, waiting in mute expectancy. The servants had left us, and only the fruits and dainties of dessert remained to tempt us in baskets and dishes of exquisitely colored Venetian glass, contrasting with the graceful clusters of lovely roses and lilies which added their soft charm to the decorative effect of the table. And Santoris passed the wine, a choice chateau ye came, round to us all, before beginning to speak again. And when he did speak, it was in a singularly quiet musical voice which exercised a kind of spell upon my ears. I had heard that voice before. Ah, how often! How often through the course of my life had I listened to it wonderingly, in dreams of which the waking morning brought no explanation. How it had stolen upon me like an echo from far away, when alone, in the pauses of work and thought, I had longed for some comprehension and sympathy. And I had reproached myself for my own fancies and imaginings, deeming them wholly foolish and irresponsible. And now, now its gentle and familiar tone went straight to the center of my spiritual consciousness, and forced me to realize that for the soul there is no escape from its immortal remembrance. End of chapter 10